you. Makes you believe it's really going to happen, doesn't it? Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Suncoast Singers. I just want to say as we're beginning uh, the opening of God's Word portion of this sermon that uh, while the evening programs are really not recommended for uh, younger children, uh, church services, we will be careful to be cer- cer- certain they are family friendly. And then also one more thing, on Monday and Tuesday we have our Pastors, Teachers, Elders Conference, and as I was reflecting on that, I thought to myself, we really should have invited our medical professionals to join us for that if they wanted. So if there are medical professionals here this morning or watching online that would like to join us on Monday or Tuesday uh, at this late hour, I'm inviting you as our guest, but you do need to call the church office and note that you will be attending. We are feeding people uh, all week long. I want to say thank you to our hospitality teams, uh, especially our leader, Stacy Gusky, and her family for their tremendous commitment. And I want to welcome this morning so many of our guests that will be here. Some have arrived already, and we'll be sharing in the Sabbath School with a panel from a number of ministries that represent the newness of life in Christ over sexual addiction and confusion. Let's pray. Lord, we want to live free and happy and fruitful for you. You've set us free, and yet the devil dogs us, Lord. He pursues us. And depending on how long and early established some of our challenges are and our besetting sins, we fight them still today. But we fight in hope, Lord. We fight in the courage, the presence, the power of the resurrected Christ. And now, Lord, I'm praying for the different facets of this topic that we will cover now over the next eight days, that you will give us divine grace, beauty, a message that is both protective and educational and redemptive and invitational. And I ask, Lord, that we would go to higher ground in loving a lost world, protecting our children, protecting our own relationship with you and being receivers of the Holy Spirit. Guide us to that end now. Teach and touch, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So good to have you all with us here this morning as we begin a week entitled Jesus and Holistic Sexuality, Ministering with Biblical Love and Confidence in an LGBTQ World. I've entitled my message this morning, Earth's Final Addiction. Can't, shouldn't, won't change. Pretty sober message. I have to admit it's not exactly what I was intending on speaking about, but as I make a prayer journey to this pulpit, Sabbath by Sabbath, I want to assure you that the message that I bring to you, I believe, is relevant to our time. It will be a challenge. It will also hopefully be a bit of education and encouragement. You know, there's things through the years that they've said can't change. I once visited with a physician who said he was in the room in California when some of the latest Uh, understanding of the ability to reverse heart disease and arterial disease was being discussed. Unfortunately, some in the room were skeptics. We know now over the last 20 plus years that indeed God designed the ability of the body to respond to change in a powerfully redemptive way and you can reverse heart disease. However, just 30 years ago, this was considered medical heresy. But with a little persistence, With a lot of research, it's been discovered to be true. Now, we know that you can reverse other diseases as well. What's on the table this week is, can diseases of the mind and the soul be reversed? Now, I want to introduce to you a couple competing ideas. One is the latest science, although it's not really that late, it's just well-developed as of late, of neuroplasticity of the mind. Neuroplasticity also known as neural plasticity or brain plasticity, is the ability of neural networks in the brain to change through growth and reorganization. Can anybody say amen? amen? Your brain can change. Your mind can be renewed. The brain can change through the growth and reorganization of these networks. It's when the brain is rewired to function in some way that differs from how it was previously functioning. And I won't go into all the detail today, 
Psychology Today explains it this way, neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to continue growing and evolving in response to life's experiences. Plasticity is the capacity of the brain to be shaped, molded, or altered. Neuroplasticity, then, is the ability for the brain to adapt or to change over time by creating new neurons and building new networks. This science is in direct contradiction at the present moment with the laws and the culture of our land, which suggests there's a certain type of problem that cannot be changed. That problem relates to the dynamics of human sexuality. Now, years ago, I did not see this movie, but years ago there was a movie based on a true story called Fly Away Home. Maybe some of you can see in your mind the picture of the ultralight leading a flock of geese from one part of the country to another part of the country. This was based on a true story. I wish I had the slide up to show you. Now, Hollywood always embellishes just a little bit, but nonetheless, these geese were bonded with their owner, and they had to be taught how to make the journey from north to south. And actually, in that film, most of the geese were real animals. Occasionally, they were computer-generated, like when one of the animals flies into the plane and hurts itself into the ultralight. I want to talk with you a little bit this morning about imprinting. It was discovered in the 1930s by um, ethologist Conrad Lorenz. He popularized the imprinting process of newborn animals, and his mentor, Oscar Heinroth, took the concept and called it imprinting. Now, Lorenz demonstrated this with his famous goslings, which had spent their first hours of life with him and subsequently followed him everywhere. And as adults, they preferred the company of humans over fellow avians. This is a phenomenon you've seen, a little cat that's being nurtured by a dog or something else like that. This is something we call imprinting. Now, here's the problem. We're living in an age where through premature exposure, be it through inappropriate activities by adults or the vicarious, which means out of body, in other words, it wasn't experienced by another individual personally, but I'll call it the vicarious inappropriateness of exposing our young people to things through media that they shouldn't be exposed to. And consequently, what we have going on is a form of human sexualization of people, a type of imprinting, which creates a desire for things that are out of order according to God's divine plan. This imprinting is recognized by different uh, counselors. You have a traumatic wrong or bad experience, the conflicting dynamics that go along with that, the guilt, the shame, the pleasure, all of it mixed up together creates a real problem for people in the rest of their life. They're trying to battle their way out of what I would call sexual imprinting. And much of the trauma that we're experiencing now in our society is a function of abuse, molestation, and vicarious exposure to things that create an initial sexual encounter that is out of order, unnatural, and warring against the lifelong happiness and joy. Some of you listening to me here today are functionaries of this. There can be no doubt in a group this big that there are not primarily women, but also potentially men who were inappropriately taken advantage of in their youth, and the rest of their life they battle for a sense of self-worth and against conflicting ideas about what that initial experience was like for them. That is what we're up against right now. Of course, we've had science that suggests that that type can't change. Now we've gone beyond that. Michigan, in the last month or so, uh, has enacted a law signed by the governor that should you have a young person that you would actually like to have some kind of rehabilitation in reorganizing those neural pathways and having a different experience with a counselor, it's now illegal. So that you could not, in this county, in this great state of Michigan, help reorganize the way your child thinks it is now illegal for a professional counselor to actually engage in reworking a new experience for your child. This is pretty serious times we're living in. Now, when it comes to this subject matter, some would just as soon leave us alone. Two generations ago, the very subject matter was taboo. It wasn't discussed in polite places, especially 
the church. It's too bad at some level that it's not properly, hasn't been properly discussed in some realm because running under the radar, all kinds of deviancies and challenges have developed which have left people vulnerable, which have allowed perpetrators to go unexposed when they should be exposed. But I'm here to suggest to you this morning that our subject matter, while delicate and difficult, is absolutely necessary because the devil has had a plan. And I'm going to show you from the experience of Israel, and I'm going to let you make your own evaluation from the experience of God's people in a world that has Babylonian ideas, Egyptian-like culture. I'm going to let you make your own mind up if he's not using the same playbook again. But what we need to understand going into this subject this morning is that God has deliverance. The power that Paul would write about in the book of 1 Corinthians where he lists off a whole host of terrible problems that the, the congregants of the Corinth church had experienced were now past history. They were not current identity. And by the way, thank you for the 12 steps. Alcohol is anonymous, anonymous, but one of the main mistakes is that with Alcoholic Anonymous, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. That's not a biblical definition of new life in Christ. It is a proper understanding of propensity or likeliness or proclivity, but it is not the way Christians who approach life. So this morning, as we make this journey together, I want you to understand that God has the power to remake our minds, our relationships, our culture, and our society. Now, back to earth's final addiction. When we begin to look at a storyline like this, there's three reasons we're holding a week like this. Number one is that God destined that His law should provide happiness and holiness and joy in life. His law is under assault. I'm here to tell you there are many, even some in our own churches, some even in leadership, who have completely lost their way in regards to the simplest statements of the inspired Word of God. And one of the reasons we're holding a summit like this is to reestablish the fact that God did say it. He said it simple enough and clear enough and powerfully enough and pointedly enough to where anybody with an ordinary level of intelligence could understand it. This is what the whole Protestant Reformation is based on, is the belief that if you were given the Word of God in your own language, you have sufficient understanding by comparing Scripture with Scripture and praying for the Holy Spirit and fellowshipping together to hear the voice of God saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Now we're living in a day and age where supposedly you can read the Word of God for what it says and some expert with some kind of advanced education can make it mean exactly the opposite of what it says. We're holding a seminar like this to establish the inspired dynamic of the Word of God. We're holding a seminar like this for education because you are assaulted continually with wrong ideas and sometimes even from inside the precincts and departments of our own denomination. And while I do believe that most of our leaders are still solid on the biblical constructs of human sexuality and relationships, there is a orthodontic, continual refiguring of the supposed gospel smile. And it's not a smile at all. The other reason we're holding a week like this is that we have in our lives various generations, our young people. There's nobody that's been under a constant assault for the innocence, the purity, the future ability to bind and commit and promise and keep. As the father of a daughter who's not yet married, and reflecting on this sermon, I've wondered to myself, how many eligible young bachelors are out there have not already been corrupted and bound at the altar of lust, whether it's vicariously or in the freewheeling experiences that are no longer frowned upon by the church or at least hardly talked about. We're so worried about extending grace that we've forgotten to create the communities of grace that said this is a firewall at which you should not extend the reach of your experience lest you come away scalded and burned for the rest of your life. Yes, we've come a long ways from the days of legalism right into the age of licentiousness. And it's killing our kids. And the third reason we hold a weekend like this and a week-long seminar is there is a redemptive call to any who find themselves in the clutches 
of confusion and addiction that would wound their current experience and destroy their opportunity for a lifelong eternity with a God of purity, faithfulness, and commitment. These are the different reasons we are doing this. While it may be a bit uncomfortable, depending on what generation you're in, I'm here to assure you today with all the best efforts of a Holy Spirit-led good taste, we are going to attempt to take on a subject matter that the world has now bowed down at the altar to over and over again. And the message is, you can't change, you shouldn't change. And the sad message I have for you this morning is, you get too many indoctrinations along this line, and you'll end up in the place where even with the most amazing revelation of divine judgment and warning and power, you won't change because you will be thoroughly remade into the image of the one who has studied the human history of this fall for the last 6,000 years. So, take your Bibles, if you would, this morning, open up to the, the, the gospel prophet, I'm going to call him, of Jeremiah. I don't know any pastor that would wish upon themselves the ministry of Jeremiah. He was a man who warned them Nebuchadnezzar was coming, and he came. He warned them after Nebuchadnezzar took off Daniel and his friends and the royal ones, he was coming back, and he came, and he took off 10,000 artisans, including the prophet Ezekiel. He warned them Nebuchadnezzar was coming back, and he came, and finally when he came, 606, 605 B.C., he destroyed the city, he destroyed the temple, thousands were killed. How would you like to be a prophet whom with the most mighty divine manifestations of judgment still is ignored? But this is the experience of Jeremiah. And when we come to Jeremiah chapter 13, we have the heartbreak of a prophetic acknowledgement that no matter what happens, things aren't going to change. I'm not going to take the time to read it because I have so much to cover this morning, but I want to tell you there are two things. One is the metaphor or parable of the linen belt that he wears. It is to represent, as it were, the closeness, the bondedness, that God's people have with him. He was to wear the linen belt, place it in a rock, leave, come back. When he came back, the belt was ruined. In the next segment, it's the story of drunkenness. It's the fact that Israel no longer can think clearly. And then we come down to this amazing, terrible epitaph of the prophet, verse 23. It says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? The answer is no. Then you also, can you also do good who are accustomed to doing evil? This is as if Jeremiah is getting a little spoiler alert to the fact that though he will minister for decades, announce certainties that actually happen and repeat themselves, like the continued confrontation with this Babylonian king that still God's people have nothing left at the end except punishment and the most painful discipline that God could give. Take your Bible, so you wouldn't turn over to the book of Hosea. Find Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Go past Daniel to the book of Hosea, chapter 5. Hosea, chapter 5. This is the painful dynamic. Anybody listening to this message this morning or later on, let me assure you this. There is no power in the human heart to recorrect. The plasticity of the mind is not able to be affected after the continued ignoring of the Holy Spirit. The idea that I'll enjoy the world and then all of a sudden when I watch your final events, I'll flip the switch is a psychological, mental incompatibility and impossibility. Hosea chapter 5, verse 4. We'll begin with verse 3. I know Ephraim and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you've played the harlot. Israel has defiled itself. Serious words. The truth of the matter is, is that most of the pagan religion throughout most of earth's history has always had a very deviant sexual dynamic to it. One that we don't talk about again in pleasant congregal gatherings. But verse 4 is perhaps the soberest part. It says, their deeds will not allow them to return to their God. For a spirit of harlotry is within them, and they do not 
know the Lord. And written in the margin of my note is a phrase I haven't used with you in a long time, but this is the phrase. It is neuroplasticity in a spiritual arena. Doing is becoming. You get good at basketball by shooting basketballs through hoops. You get good at programming by program. You get good at surgery by holding the knife after the anesthesia has been applied. Whatever you do, you get better at as you do it and you become it. A sober, sober reality. I want everybody, when this sermon is over, and by the way, the second sermon presented by Dr. Eric Walsh will end up being a part two to this sermon even though we did not corroborate in the preparation of it. It's the Holy Spirit's leading. But I want you to know something. You can't swim in the cesspool of American culture and come out smelling like a rose. And your kids are swimming in it. And it's time that we as Adventists have a beautiful ability to reach the lost, even as we protest the lost mentalities that have created a platform for self-destruction. It's absolutely imperative as Christians that we are the most loving and lovable people. I sat around yesterday with several of my friends from Coming Out Ministries, and if there's one thing that came out clear is that when somebody decides to change their mind, when the Holy Spirit breaks in and up, and they've gone past I can't change, and they've gone past I shouldn't change, and they're almost to the place where I won't change, the one thing that creates the link for redemption is an absolute loving and lovable Christian. When people come into this church and they're dressed different and they act different and they might even be here with somebody that is outside of God's plan, there is a powerful opportunity to recognize the fact that they walk through these doors is a statement that they're at least open to thinking about something different. And when they get here, they should find it. And while we must protest the culture and protest the laws and protest the lifestyle, we must present the most winning, loving, beautiful, genuine spiritual integrity in reaching the lost. This is not a week about putting down something. This is a week about lifting up a living Christ who actually has the ability to take advantage of the neuroplasticity he put into the lives and minds of people and give them what he said he could give them, a new heart. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, Again, we're rolling on. When we come to the experience of Israel, I'm not going to look these things up with you, but I'm going to give you the big picture, then I'm going to give you the text, and I'm going to let you deal with it. In preparing for this message, I become absolutely convinced that the culture of the generation that came out of Egypt was so absolutely corrupted by sensuality that the only way they could be reached, for those that were reached, was a twofold manifestation of God's power. The first manifestation are ten plagues. The continuing manifestations are a Red Sea split wide open. There's water out of a rock. There's food on dry ground. There's a cloud by day. There's a fire by night. There's the destruction of the Egyptian armies. And there are more. There's the bitter waters turned sweet at Mara. There's Moses on the mountain, the quaking, the shaking, the light, the awesome, majestic expression of the divine personage of Jesus Christ. You have all these things, but it didn't work. They'll come all the way up to Kadesh Barnea, and there's worse than that before they get there, but Kadesh is right on the verge of the promised land, and they won't go. So the first part of God's attempt to reach a corrupted culture is divine manifestation, but it's not enough, at least not for everyone. The second part of God's attempt to reach a corrupted culture is 40 years of patience. Amazing, powerful, continuing, resplendent glory, teaching and patience. Now I'm going to tell you how those things are bookended. They're both bookended with two experiences that are almost the same. In Exodus chapter 16, they're not too far out of the experience of the Egyptians. And what are they doing? They're complaining about what? The food. God in Exodus 16 will not only provide them food, but he will send them quail. The interesting thing is, later in the book of Numbers, at the end of their journey, they'll do the same thing. They'll complain and God will send them quail. It will be 
It will be three feet deep for a distance of a day's walk. Can you imagine? So in the beginning, there's no punishment that comes with God for sending them the quail. In the end, there is a huge punishment. And while the food is between their teeth, the Bible says a plague breaks out. They had come to where they loved the leeks and the what? The onions. They were people who had learned to, they were degraded by the culture around them, and they, they experienced a sensual relationship to life, which it was almost impossible for them to shake. We said, well, pastor, pastor, pastor. Now listen, I'm going to tell you, there's two things Ellen White talks about over and over again that are super important. One is appetite and one is passion. So we got food and sex. And the truth of the matter is, they're both made to be good. Especially if they're experienced inside God's ordained dynamic of self-control and commitment and proper boundaries. They're both amazing. I mean, I was sitting in worship last night and my mother-in-law says to me, isn't it wonderful that God made everything with so many colors? It could all be gray. It could all be brown. It could even all be green. That would be a bit much, wouldn't it? But I want to tell you something. Our God made things so beautiful to experience, and he gave us the senses to enjoy them. Could I hear an amen? But the devil takes advantage of them to heighten them to a place of self-destruction and selfish indulgence to where people are bound to things. Now, the worst thing to be bound to is something that's naturally supposed to be expressed in a good way. So you have appetite and passion. You get those things out of bounds, and you've got a problem. Now let's go to the other book ending, one of which I'm going to take a little bit more to talk about. You come to the experience of Exodus 32. They are living in the shadow of Mount Sinai. And in the shadow of Mount Sinai, Moses goes up the mountain. He's by himself. He's not gone that long, and everybody's getting jittery. They're thinking maybe the fire on the mountain consumed him. They come to Aaron, and they say to Aaron, make us a god. We don't know what happened to him. And you know, as we're going to look here briefly, they ate, they rose up to play. And their playing was basically a large desert-type environment for indulgence across the broad spectrum, which goes all the way to the dynamic of passion. Now I want to take you to the end of the Israelite sojourn after 40 years. What do you have? Here they are. Balaam can't curse them, but Balaam gives them a good idea. Here's the good idea. Go get those Midianite women and send them into the camp and destroy their experience and their protection with another version of what was 38 and a half years ago, almost 40. You see, Israel's experience is bookended with appetite and passion. And I'm here to tell you, their experience is similar to ours. You know what that means? We're on the verge of going into the promised land because the devil's pulling out the best things he's got. Because earth's final addiction is an addiction to something that out of bounds is self-destructive. But inside God's dynamics of lawful commitment and proper joy and expression is good. But you can get rid of meth. You can put off heron heroin, you can lay aside the marijuana and all these other things, but it's impossible to lay aside these two reoccurring natural good things once they've been twisted and imprinted on a person the wrong way. Now, having said that, I want you to understand the story of deliverance for God's people through the ages, whether it's God getting his people into the promised land eventually, or whether it's the new birth of the church or the final new birth of the church, God's going to get it done. The question is, will we subscribe to earth's messaging that you can't change? You shouldn't try to change. And eventually you're left with the fact you're completely satisfied with yourself. It's a done deal. You won't. Take your Bibles and turn over, if you would, quickly to Exodus chapter 32. Let's look at it just a little bit, because here they are, not many days removed from the most manifest power and divine expression of deliverance that any generation on the face of the earth has ever had. God knows that they are culturally corrupted, and yet they are His people, and He has the power to redeem them. And they are in a journey moving with Him, but when push comes to shove, they would just as quickly abandon the old ways which require some self-sacrifice, some self-denial, some self-control. Chapter 32, verse 1, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron. They said, Come, make us a God who will go up before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. 
Aaron said to him, tear off your gold rings which are in your ears, the ears of your wife, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. Now tear is a pretty nasty word. And besides, Aaron thought the pride and the love of wealth, they wouldn't do it, but they did. Verse 3, then all the people tore off their gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand, he fashioned it with a graving tool, made it into a molten calf, and they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of, e of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, okay, he's under pressure for the first part, but Patriarchs and Prophets is very clear, not for this next part. He built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they rose up early, offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. And that's a euphemism. And for those of you that don't know what euphemisms are, let me just put it this way. It's a nice way to say something you don't really want to say too explicitly. And there they are, Moses up on the mountain with Joshua. We know the story. They're up there on the mountain. God sees what's going on. He says, I'm ready to, I'm ready to cast them off and make a new nation of you. Moses goes into intermediary mode, intercessory mode. God continues developing the character of Christ and this man who once thought he could take it into his own hands. They come down. Joshua says, there's war in the camp. And Moses says, oh no, we could only wish. But Moses is not prepared for the debauchery and when he finally gets down and sees it, he is so incensed that he takes the commandments, the tablets cut out by God's hands, written on both sides, and he throws them to the base of the mountain and he confronts his brother. This is what Patriarchs and Prophets says, such a crisis demanded a man of firmness, decision, and unflinching courage, one who held the honor of God above popular fable, personal safety, or life itself. And the next sentence is one of the saddest ones you're going to read in the spirit of prophecy. She says, but the present leader, talking about Aaron, was not of this character. Listen, friends. She'll go on to say there are still pliant Aaron's who, while holding positions of authority in the church, will yield to the desires of the unconsecrated and thus encourage them in their sin. Now, I want you to think about it. At this point in time, I've not had the experience that some have had. And for those that have had it, my heart goes out in genuine brotherly sympathy and prayerful support to you. But there are people whose children have grown up and for whatever various reasons have decided to announce, they've decided to come out, as it were, from hiding. Although I don't think many are hiding anymore. It's now worn as a badge of pride. It's now worn as a badge of honor. And our young people are learning not so insidiously that it's only closed-minded, legalistic, judgmental, unkind, and uncaring people who would say anything to make anybody feel bad about who they are. This is where we're at, friends. This is why we're doing this series. Because if we don't create some kind of proper counterculture that is better, something much better and more beautiful, if we can't model the right way and teach the right way and redeem from the wrong way, what kind of people are we? But I'm here to tell you there are people in the church whose kids, some in leadership, whose kids have announced that they hold this new identity. And now people solid on this subject for all their life are remaking their theologies. And now we're in a position where people are actually taking the plainest words of Scripture and making them say something very different. And what's worse than that, when Moses came into the camp, he confronted the rebels. Ellen White tells us if Aaron had had the courage to stand for right, irrespective of the consequences, he could have presented the apostasy. Deuteronomy 9 tells us Aaron should have died for this, but Moses pled for him. Spirit of prophecy is clear, and the Bible as well, that thousands died because one man in a position of authority was people-loving and pliant. And in the process, people lost their lives, and we can be certain many for all of eternity. Aaron's yielding spirit and his desire to please had blinded his eyes to the enormity of the crime he was sanctioning. Is there anybody else blind we might be dealing with? I want you to think about it. As I visited yesterday with Wayne Blakely, his mom and dad for 40 years prayed for him. His mom and dad lived 75 years. I wanted, they, mar they were married for 75 years, lived to a ripe old age. 
the testimony of this man that his parents were the genuine deal. And when he brought his gay and homosexual friends around, you know what the testimony of his parents were? There was not going to be any hanky-panky on their property. There was not going to be any compromising of principle on the, in their presence. But I'll tell you what. They knew their son was lost. And the testimony of his friends were, you have the most amazing parents. Now, I'm here to tell you, Christianity is quite capable of standing for truth, being pure and true, and also not compromising their identity in Christ. It doesn't need to be a negative in the lives of anybody that's honest. Of course, for the militant and the aggressive on the other side, they must use all kinds of disparaging techniques to try to pry our hands off the loving and lovable witness of a Christian that can't be counterbalanced and can't be naysayed against. When we look at the life of Aaron, we see that there is this amazing contrast. The people looked at Aaron and they thought, oh, what an admirable person. He's so calm. They looked at the indignancy and anger of, of Moses and he appeared to be somebody that wasn't very Godlike. The truth of the matter was, was that God had moved on the heart of Aaron to be indignant, is the word. Indignant, and probably something more than that. When we think about what's needed in this age, there is a place for a divine tenderness and gentleness. We don't ever want to extinguish the smoldering hope that's in the flax of someone's heart that they could change if they wanted to or that maybe they should change. So it's important. We shouldn't change as a people to suggest that they can't or shouldn't change. But why would they want to change unless they had something better like the love of Christ and the beauty of a Christian home? This is where the church is at and it's important that we recognize it. Now, God would have his servants prove their loyalty by faithfully rebuking transgression, however painful the act may be. And those who are honored with a divine commission are not to be weak, pliant time servers. They are not to aim for self-exaltation or shun just disagreeable duties, but to perform God's work with unswerving fidelity. All right. I'd like to take a little more time there. Can't do it, so now let's go to the conclusion. I'm going to bring a couple things together here. I want to remind you in the book of Luke, chapter 22, that Jesus is in the garden, the mob is on its way, and here comes Judas. And what does Judas do? He walks up to Jesus with his arms out. What does that mean? I want to give you a hug. And they're going to exchange the Middle Eastern face-to-face, -face, what we call kiss. When Judas gets close to Jesus, Jesus doesn't do this. Jesus doesn't do this. Jesus puts his arms out. He embraces his betrayer and he says as they have cheek against cheek, you wouldn't betray me with a kiss, would you? What's that all about? Isn't that Jesus saying, I know what you're doing? Isn't that Jesus saying, I'd take you back right now if you'd admit it? Isn't that Jesus extending the final gospel olive branch to a man who has sold his soul day in and day out with greed and a desire for selfish ambition and place? Isn't that what it is? Now I'm going to take you to one final chapter in the great controversy. Someone pointed this out to me recently. I appreciate it. Although if they watch this sermon, I want them to know something. If you read the chapter in Patriarchs and Prophets on them, the golden calf experience, the word punishment and punish is used over and over and over. God does punish his children. God does punish transgression. God hates to see anybody die. He takes no delight in the death of the wicked, but God himself will end this controversy. I want to take you to the moment when the Mount of Olives separates in the middle like Zechariah says it will. God purifies a small piece of human earthly real estate and he sets 
the New Jerusalem down on it. Is the New Jerusalem as big as Arizona or as big as the United States? I don't know. Different people conjecture. But I want you to know that Jesus says in John chapter 5, there's a resurrection of the unjust and the damned, and there's a resurrection of the just. Jesus resurrects all people who have ever been alive on the face of the planet that aren't inside the city after a thousand years of examining why they're not inside the city. That's where we are. The new Jerusalem has just come down. Now Satan prepares for the last mighty struggle for supremacy, great controversy. While deprived of his power and cut off from his work of deception, the prince of evil was miserable and dejected. But as the wicked dead are raised, and he sees the vast multitude upon his side, his hopes revive, and he determines not to yield the great controversy. He will marshal all the armies of the lost under his banner and through them endeavor to execute his plan. The wicked are Satan's captives. Now I want you to think about this because I'm going to come up to a line in the great controversy you haven't noticed before, most of you. But what I want you to understand, there's a point in time when they say you can't change. Then society goes to a point in time when they say you shouldn't change and nobody should try to change you. Of course, the Holy Spirit has to do that. But if your presence, by the way, this week we're going to watch a little bit of interview and dialogue about a man in the Middle East who's on trial because he communicated his Bible beliefs and 22 people came out to accuse him of them making them feel dirty and ashamed. Our world's messed up, friends. You won't want to miss it. But here we are in rejecting Christ. They've accepted the rule of the rebel leader. Can't shouldn't, won't. They're ready to receive his suggestions and do his bidding. Yet, true to his early cunning, he does not acknowledge himself to be Satan. He claims to be the prince who's the rightful owner of the world and whose inheritance has been unlawfully wrested from him. Lies, more lies. Steal, kill, and destroy. He represents himself to his deluded subjects as a redeemer assuring them that his power has brought them forth from their graves and that he's about to rescue them from the most cruel tyranny. Thank God and his law. The presence of Christ having been removed, Satan works wonders to support his claims. He makes the weak strong, inspires all with his own spirit and energy. He proposes to lead them against the camp of the saints and to take possession of the city of God. And with fiendish exaltation, he points to the unnumbered millions who have been raised from the dead and declares that as their leader, he will be well able to overthrow the city and regain his kingdom and throne. At last, the order to advance is given, and the countless host moves on. An army such as was never summoned by earthly conquerors, such as the combined forces of all ages since war began, or earth could never equal. Satan, the mightiest warrior, leads the van, and his angels unite their forces for his final struggle. Kings and warriors are in his train, and the multitudes follow in the vast companies, each under its appointed leader with military precision. The serried ranks advance over the earth, broken and un even service to the city of God. One more sentence is all I'm going to read you. I'm not going to read it just yet. They've made their new machines of war. They're completely convinced they can do this. Satan's not Satan. He's Jesus. <laughs> I mean, right at the very end, they're his captives. They've machined all kinds of weaponry don't think they're coming just with swords and clubs and knives. No. I want you to know that now above the city of God, the throne of God has been lifted up and surrounding him are all the people that have been redeemed. The closest ones to him are the ones who, like the apostle Paul, were active agents of Satan trying to destroy the church. That's who's the closest. The next closest are the ones whose character was perfected probably, I would assume, during the last stages of earth's history. And then there's an unnumbered multitude, which we all want to be there. Amen. And then this sentence. I want you to think about the ramifications of what this sentence means. There's the new Jerusalem. Here they come. And here's the next sentence. Gen uh, Great Controversy 664. By the command of Jesus, the gates of the new Jerusalem are closed. Why were they open? 
The gates of the New Jerusalem are closed and the armies of Satan surround the city and make ready for the onset. Judas, you're not betraying me with a kiss, are you? The gates are open to show that you might start out thinking you can't change. Then you might get some affirmation from somebody with a big degree or a lot of money and control to say you shouldn't change, maybe even legal forbidding. But I want you to know right up to the very end of the age, the human heart is deceitfully wicked beyond all understanding, and who can find it out except one? Search me, O God, and know me. See if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me into the past everlasting friends. Don't give up on Jesus. He has the power to take you no matter where you're at or where you've been or what tentacles are wrapped around you. You might be beholden with the cords of appetite or passion. Don't give up. Keep looking to Jesus, the one who made neuroplasticity a reality in the knowledge that he would take advantage of it to remake the way we think and live and go. And while it may take you a lifetime and you may battle for a lifetime, depending on how wrongly imprinted your past is, it's okay. The day's coming when the battle will end and all things will be made new and you won't have to fight that battle anymore. In the meantime, glory, hallelujah, the one who has been resurrected from the grave and broken the bonds of the tomb can break the bonds of sin and set us free. Listen, I had never before noticed that the gates of the city were open until the final attack. Anybody that wanted to come in could come in, <laughs> except they couldn't because they were bound up as captives of Satan by their own choosing. It's a choice, friends. When Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus shows up. Where are you? Where are you? And he says, you know what? It's not Eve's fault. You ate the fruit with your own choice. And it's not the snake's fault. You were deceived, but you ate the fruit with your own choice. But he says to the snake, your days are numbered. <laughs> I'm going to become a man. I'm going to go all the way to the most ignominious death. I'm going to suffer at your hands. The venom's going to curse through my veins. But before I die, I'm going to step on your head. And these people will not be left stuck with you. All of heaven poured out. And we've got some people in the church going around saying you can't change. All of heaven poured out, and we even have some going around saying you shouldn't change. And the religion of the world, which is hedonism, and the new altar of expression and identity, which is sexuality, is being exalted in our laws. And where is the church? Could we please show up loving and lovable, but like an army terrible with banners who's not getting out of the fight? Because the day will come when if there's no protest by loving and lovable Christians, they'll be stuck and they won't be able to change. It'll be too late. The harvest is ended. We're lost. These are the words of Jeremiah. Oh, may they not be repeated because the church fails to show up, to do different than Aaron and to live like Moses and to give the witness. You can change. It's in the brain. It's in the power of the nail-pierced hands. It's a command of fiat which spoke the world into existence. If you want to change, you can change. You shouldn't stay the same. And life will be wonderfully different. Let's stand together as we sing our closing hymn.